thanks for uh, rousing yourself out of bed so early and making it down here on a Monday morning. We appreciate uh, you coming along. I'm sure there'll be a few people drifting in as, uh, as we get going, but uh, I thought we'd uh, try and make a start now so we have plenty of time for uh, discussion. Uh, my name's Richard Downey. I'm uh, Deputy Director of the Africa Program here at uh, CSIS. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, this morning for our panelists and, and a chance really to tackle uh, the Sudan referendum. Uh, probably being Monday morning, we get first crack uh, at discussing the referendum which uh, began over the weekend. So as we, uh, as we sit here and uh, discuss uh, the Sudan this morning, the people of southern Sudan uh, are in the middle of making uh, a historic decision, as you know. Uh, voting began yesterday in the referendum on their future whether to uh, remain part of Sudan or to secede and form their own nation. Millions of people uh, appear to have taken that opportunity so far in the first day and a half of, of voting, uh, many of them lining up outside polling stations hours before they opened, uh, patiently awaiting their chance to play their part in settling the future direction of, of southern Sudan. Uh, a few months ago, it seemed unlikely we were even going to get to this point, uh, at least on time. But we've seen a big push uh, in recent weeks by the international community to get the arrangements on track. And of course, the Sudanese people themselves have taken the lead, uh, channeling their energies into making this process work. Uh, so the result uh, in recent weeks, uh, we've also seen uh, public statements by uh, politicians, both north and south that have helped to reduce tensions and create an environment where we can be more confident that the process will go smoothly and the outcome will accurately reflect the will of the people who take part in it. So this is a momentous time uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, presence of our representatives from the government of, southern, uh, of Sudan and southern Sudan as well, uh, who in getting to this point uh, today have traveled a long way through decades of civil war, of course, uh, the peace agreement in 2005, and uh, the subsequent six-year uh, long process of, of trying to make this, uh, this deal work. So we're glad they can uh, join us, and, and we look uh, forward to perhaps hearing them speak as well this morning. Uh, but today we're going to reflect a little bit about uh, upon how Sudan has arrived at this moment, uh, but mainly we're going to look forward and think about the upcoming challenges as well because uh, while those who've worked on the referendum, of course, deserve a great deal of credit for the fact that it's taking place uh, on time, uh, and so far at least in a, a relatively orderly fashion, uh, the referendum isn't the end of the road. Uh, as Salva Kiir himself said yesterday as he cast his vote in Juba, you know, it's premature to say uh, job done. In many ways, the real challenges lie ahead, uh, particularly in the six month long period following the referendum. If the vote comes out in favor of secession, uh, this will be the time when the tough negotiations really begin in earnest on all the issues which will help determine relations between North and South for years to come. And of course, the fate of Abye remains undecided. People there have been denied their chance to vote in a separate referendum on whether to remain part of the North or join the South. And we've had worrying reports of violence there during the past few days. So our speakers are going to discuss uh, some of these big issues today and perhaps say something about the role of the international community and the, the role they can play going forward. The United States, uh, Sudan's neighbors, and the African Union as well. So we're very pleased this morning to be joined uh, by two experienced analysts from uh, International Crisis Group, an organization uh, whose thoughtful analysis and well-researched reports that we, all, we always found, find useful here on the Africa program. Um, on my immediate left, we have uh, uh, ICG's new Africa program director, Comfort Aero. Uh, Comfort oversees uh, uh, four different projects in Africa covering Central, Southern, West, and the Horn of Africa, 20 countries in all within these regions. <coughs> uh, Comfort was uh, previously a director of the South Africa office and deputy director of the Africa program at the International Center for Transitional Government. Uh, transitional justice, I apologize. And we're delighted also to have with us uh, Fuad Hikmat, who's ICG's African Union and Sudan Special Advisor. Uh, Fuad takes part in the management of all of uh, ICG's work in relation to Sudan and the AU, uh, 
and his professional background includes management of humanitarian and post-conflict programming. Uh, he's literally just touched down in DC this morning uh, from Sudan as well, so uh, he can give us really the up-to-the-minute uh, uh, perspective on what's going on uh, in Sudan now. Uh, no pressure there as well. So uh, uh, I'm going to hand over to Comfort. First of all, he's going to give us an overview of ICG's work uh, uh, and the situation before passing over to Fuad, and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and, and comments from, from all of you as well, hopefully. Thanks very much. Comfort. Thank you very much, and um, I'd like to start by um, wishing you all a happy new year, but also thanking CICS, especially um, Jennifer and Richard and the staff of the Centre for hosting um, International Crisis Group on the day after the start of the important referendum. I also think it's quite telling that the very first job for the new Africa director for ICG is to come to Washington and to speak to the gathering here, um, and that that shows you also the importance of Washington in the question of the future of a new New Sudan and the future of North Sudan as well. So it's a pleasure and an honor that we've been asked to, to come this morning, very cold morning, but this morning in, in Washington to talk about a, a new dawn um, in, in, in Africa as well. Just briefly, as Richard um, was saying, I, I would start off by just introducing um, the International Crisis Group to all of you, for some of you who don't know it. Um, we are generally recognized as an independent, nonpartisan um, organization that services or provides analysis to governments and international governmental bodies um, like the United Nations, um, the European Union, and the World Bank. And we, we work quite closely with a number of organizations like the CICS here in Washington. And we were founded um, about 15 years ago in 1995 as an, as an inter independent um, non-governmental organization um, on an initiative by um, a number of transatlantic figures who, were di who despaired over um, the international community's failure back in the 1990s on tragedies such as Somalia, Rwanda, and Bosnia, and even at that time, Sudan as well. And we are quite well known for the reports that we publish. Um, it wavers between 80 and 90 um, reports that we do. And I even, even in the Sudan program, the Sudan team, Fawad and Zach, could, if they were given a lot of leeway, write 80 reports in the space of three months in, in Sudan because of the nature of the situation there. We also produce what we call the Crisis Watch Bulletin, which provides a monthly snapshot of what we consider to be the conflict alert um, countries at that moment in, in the month. We have several advocacy offices, and most of you may know our Washington office. We also have an office in Brussels um, and in New York as well, and the headquarters for the Africa program is strategically located in Nairobi, which is a critical hub for us. And as Richard has already said, um, as the Africa director, we operate in, in 20 different countries across the continent. And before I joined um, ICG, I was at ICTJ, but also the United Nations mission in Liberia as well. Specifically on, on Sudan, my colleague Fawad will go into more deeper details on Sudan. But I also just want to acknowledge um, that this is a momentous um, moment in the history of the continent. When you're looking for key moments, key dates on the continent, we'll make reference to 1957, Ghana as the first independent um, country on the, con on the continent after the end of decolonization. We'll also note the freedom of Nelson Mandela in 1990 and the end of apartheid in 1994. This is another historical moment in, on, on the continent, the birth of a new nation, and the key co um, concern for us is how that is going to unfold. The voting for the referendum, as Richard um, already pointed out, started yesterday on the question of self-determination, of self which may result um, in the independence of the South. Two decades of war have come to an end in, in Sudan in 2005 with the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. But now we are at a stage where the delicate peace is going to be tested. While securing the referendum has been an international priority, the long-term stability of the region lies in the ability of the North and South to forge a post-CPA post relationship. And the situation, if it goes well, will see the smooth outcome of, of the referendum. 
And if the, the results are respected by the Khartoum government, then we should see some significant progresses being, being made. And this would provide a perfect platform for negotiations for post-referendum um, um, arrangements to go successfully. But should the vote go poorly, we might also witness a, re um, a reignition of conflict in between the North and the South, and also an escalation of the violence in Darfur, which Fawad will, t will talk about. And again, also, the, 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 the impact on the region will also be quite grave. So at this point, the situation is quite fluid and it's quite uncertain how things are going to go. The situation is quite tricky in creating a new and independent southern Sudan, which already is being dubbed as a pre-failed state. The borders remain undecided. And meanwhile, in Juba, the nascent capital, institutions and services which, are, which urgently need to be regenerated and rebuilt, this is still a fundamental issue at stake for the new, new South Sudan. The future arrangements on citizenship, on nationality, on national resources, on wealth sharing, on management of oil and water, currency, assets, and the liabilities, security, and international treaties must be negotiated regardless of the referent outcome. These are issues that we pointed out in our update briefing that we produced in December towards the end of last year. And of course, the question of the future of Abyei needs to be addressed, as well as the popular consultations in Kordofan and the Blue Nile. Of course, we must congratulate UNIMID and UNIS and IFAS um, for their work in the last few weeks in bringing out the voter registration process. There will be a need for a cohesive statement from relevant actors, in particular in this instance, we call upon the African Union and key leading states on the continent, Nigeria, South Africa, Ethiopia and Egypt also, to make the necessary statements, positive statement in relation to Sudan. And of course, the Secretary General's monitoring panel for the referendum on Sudan needs to take a more public leading role in the pronouncements made over the next three weeks. And there must be a careful monitoring and communication over the, these next three weeks, which we judge to be a tense period for Sudan. The, the real challenge, the real um, issue that we need to avoid in this next three weeks is disinformation, is rumors, and these themselves are real triggers for instability. And of course, here in Washington, we can't forget the role of the United, the United States government. The US incentives have been very helpful, however, ultimately limited, given that Khartoum is politically savvy enough to understand that it's the US Congress and not the executive that makes many key decisions on the table. The absence of a basic blueprint for the post-2011 referendum between the North and South contributes to the uncertainties about the political and economic future of each and risks the referendum being viewed as a zero-sum game that sustains fears and smooths the conduct of, a, of, of, of the exercise and acceptance of the result. Added to this is the deterioration situation in Darfur and concerns about ensuring a more credible and serious negotiation process ongoing in, in Doha, Qatar. Ensuring stability in the, in the South and improved relations between the North and the South in the post-referendum climate will be critical to solving the Darfur problem. This is a critical time for Sudan, but also for Africa. Getting the situation right in Sudan will be, it will be a significant and game-changing moment for the continent, but also for the international community also. We therefore welcome this opportunity today to engage in a debate with you all here on the, fu on the future and how to guarantee stability in the North and South and a, new, and a new North. While we concentrate heavily on the future of South Sudan, we mustn't forget also that the future of the North is at stake as well. So I'll turn back to Richard, who will introduce Fawad. Thank you. Thanks very much for that uh, overview, Comfort. And uh, yeah, I'll pass straight over to uh, Fuad. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, good morning. And uh, our protocol observed. And, uh, and I want to say that, uh, I mean, my, uh, my director impressed me very much. I mean, she's saying she's new, but her speech doesn't sound like she's new. I mean, uh, because I think she did half what I'm supposed to do. She already did half of my briefing, uh, which made things uh, easier to me. And, uh, but I would like to start by saying thank you so much uh, for the CIS uh, to invite us for this event. And, uh, and, uh, and it is a difficult moment for me as a Sudanese. And uh, if I remove my hat 
from the ICG at the end, I am Sudanese, and this is about human relations. And I'm, uh, as far as I am very, very happy for South Sudanese to go and vote for this historical moment and to get their country. And if I am on that side, I will be happy and jubilating for a lot of reasons, and I'm happy for that. But also, as a Sudanese, to see the map that we knew it from uh, the primary school, that we draw it now by heart, and, uh, the map of Sudan. I don't know how we are going to, to draw it uh, in, in six months' time. And uh, the, the south borders, it will be very difficult to, to draw. Uh, it's a very, very sad moment for us. But uh, <clears throat> I, for me, it is not a surprise that uh, Sudan is going to see it. Uh, and uh, because uh, before going to talk about the challenges, I think one of the, the main reasons that underpinning the current context is that the two parties simply failed to implement the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. It is the mistake of the two in their fail, they to, to fail to, to implement the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. I don't hold the two parties only on the cessation of South Sudan that they couldn't maintain the unit. I think if we want to do that, we can go up to the, from the first uh, government that they took uh, control of Sudan after independence. The responsibility goes from there. And I think all the government failed. But focusing on the CPA, uh, the, the CPA, it had got two important principles. One is democratic transition, and including in that is the reconciliation process. And hopefully that if the tra democratic transition happened, reconciliation happened, that will foster the second principle, which is the self-determination that it makes unity attractive for the southerners. Those two principles did not happen for a lot of political reasons. And, and, and as we know that a, a benchmark in the democratic transformation was the elections that were supposed to happen in the half of the interim period, the third, fourth year of the interim period, to leave another three years of the second half of the interim period to foster the constitutional and legal arrangements being done in the first half, and then to work in these three years to make sure that unity is going to make attractive. Elections didn't happen in the third or fourth year. It happened six or eight months just before the end of the interim period, so three years been uh, shortened to eight months for a lot of reasons. And both, of course, they wanted to, to, to augment their influence of, 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 uh, of control, their power to remain in power. And, 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 and that's why I think they didn't want the elections to happen on time. So both, I think, failed in, in, in these three principles, the democratic transformation, if I can consider reconciliation as another principle, and the, but the only success is that they reach the referendum. And, uh, and so for me then, when I look into the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, all what I can describe it from Comprehensive Peace Agreement that it became a grand ceasefire for six years. There is a ceasefire in six years and now after six uh, years that the question here is can we maintain that ceasefire? So, so and, 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 and the other reason is also, and, and, I, and, and I want here to draw specifically on the Islamists, when they took power in 1989, they had their own vision for uh, Sudan. And unfortunately, that vision could not accommodate the preferences because they saw the preferences as marginal, as, as minority groups rather than groups of their own right. And they wanted to maintain power, so the CPA, which reduced their power from 100% to 52%. Well, it gave the SPLM 28% uh, and the other political parties the remaining. They saw that in these six years, how they can continue maintain the power rather than looking into inclusivity and pluralism. And that is, I think, one of the problems that made the CPA to fail. So separation is a logical outcome. And I don't think unity is going to be an outcome because this will be magic. And I don't think there is happy magics in Sudan. What there is is sadness always. And, and, and I hope that one day that this turns into some of happiness. So the challenges are immense. And then let, let me focus on a few things. The, the post-referendum issues, of course, are, are 
we will come to there. But the referendum itself is a procedural. It's a procedure. But it is happening in an environment where there is serious tension, there is a serious nervousness and volatility. That is where this procedure is happening. And at the same time, there is no full agreement on any of the post-referendum issues, none. And uh, also, there is a military buildup along the borders. And there is an economic embargo on the South. So if we see in the, in the last weeks, the government, or let's maybe say it, President Bashir, it's not the government of national unity made this decision. Let's make a distinction here. Sometimes when President Bashir talks on behalf of the government of national unity, is not actually talking on behalf of the SPLM because still this is the government of national unity. And he made a decision that 20% of the southerners on the civil service, they are going to go home after secession. And uh, refused to give these Sudanese uh, people citizenship uh, only on if there is a political arrangement and to be dealt as foreigners. To give you an example that there is 24,000 Southern Sudanese students in the universities in Khartoum. What is going to happen to these 24,000 if you send them home? And uh, at the same time, we know that there is a lot of people going back now to South Sudan, over 100,000, that they are really in a very dire situation where there is no humanitarian assistance, no shelter, and, and, and so on. And uh, I. I I question that question from the NCP. It is an NCP uh, rather than a government of national unity decision. So recently, for example, that uh, there are the commercial transactions or vital goods, transfer of vital goods, the South Sudan's are blocked. The cereal market in Obeid for the sorghum and so on. Uh, they, they, they got the message that not, uh, not to transfer a lot of cereals to the south of Sudan. The transfer of oil is becoming a very big problem. Now in Juba, the barrel of oil shot from 350 to 750 Sudanese Guinea. So over 100%. Prices shot to 30 to 40% in South Sudan. These are policies are not favorable for uh, a, a mutual and good relationship between the north and south. So this, this sort of direction, it will ref reflect negatively on the communities who live, uh, live along the borders of uh, uh, 1956, especially the Baggara. Because if the SPLM reciprocates such policies by blocking, for example, the nomads who have like 11.5 million heads of cattle that they spent nine months along the borders of 1956 or south of the borders of 1956. That is their livelihoods for the last 200, 300, 500 years. If the South SPLM reciprocate that by blocking that, that will be very serious for the Baggara. And they are very serious constituency of Sudan. Uh, and, 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 these, and these communities along the borders are highly militarized. As we know that in Abyei, the Ngong Dinka are highly militarized, but also the Baggara are highly militarized. They have been used, abused during the last wars through militias, popular defense forces, and they were like the front line of, of, uh, of the regime in the last 20 years in the fighting the war uh, against the South, highly militarized. So the, the, this kind of policies in the last weeks made some people and analysts in Sudan to describe like this kind of policy direction from the NCP rather than from the government. It's a sort of like a soft or, 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 uh, or, the, inter, or the first steps to sort of an ethnic cleansing. And, and, and now it is debatable because that's a, that's a legal term. But when you deny your own citizens the right, which is actually the Constitution of Sudan, Article 7, between brackets 4, 7-4, it says that Sudan allows dual citizenship. Sudanese can have citizenship of other uh, countries. And even the president does not have the right to remove the citizenship of a person by birth or even by nationalization. And the international laws also doesn't accept that. 
So what I think it is important now for the North and the South is to secure a strategic relationship to mitigate these consequences of the, of the, of the political separation. It is a political. So they need to focus on the economic and financial union, unity, and, 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 and looking into the common markets. But as I said, on the contrary, NCP direction and approach appears to be a very, very difficult one. Talking about an state based on ethnic and religious hegemony. And this raises the nervousness of those who are living in southern Kurdufan and Blue Nile because yet their situation is not yet resolved and they are part of the North. Therefore, the challenge, I think one of the main challenges in the coming six months is that how to avoid, to avoid the conditions that could lead to confrontation, military confrontation along the borders. Uh, unfortunately, as I say, that both parties and particularly in the North are creating the conditions that could aggravate the situation along the borders. They are actively mobilizing tribes along the borders to rejoin the PDF, the Popular Defense Forces. And on the pretext that they are going to lose their interest or their interest is going to be jeopardized by the cessation of uh, South Sudan. So if this referendum doesn't go well and the results is not accepted, it means that the separation will not go smoothly. The transitional period will be full of, of violence, in my opinion. And the aggravation of relationship between the communities along the borders will aggravate the situation in Abyei. And Abyei can trigger a war between communities that it will drag the SAF, the Sudan Armed Forces, and the SPLM into wider conflict that could derail the whole process. And, and it will be very difficult for the two parties to conclude the CPA. So as I said, and that in the last six months, they failed to find solutions to the post-referendum issues. Although that there is a, a framework presented by the African Union High Implementation Panel, which includes principles, but no solutions. And I think what is important now is to discuss the issue of the citizenship and the economic relationship that it affects day-to-day -day lives of the people along the borders. If the issue of the citizenship is resolved, in the interest of, of both, I think it could open the space for political dialogue and reaching an agreement on the post-referendum issues, the kind of a border, and so on. I think that is an entry for the post-referendum. And then it, there is no need for this huge military buildup that we see now along the borders, north of the borders and south of borders, a very serious one. And, and, uh, and uh, the second challenge, which I want to draw the the panel here, the attention to which people there are not aware of it, is Southern Kurdufan and the Blue Nile. These two have got forces inside South Sudan and also along the borders of 1956. These are military forces that they fought with the SPLM all the last years. They fought for their rights. They have a protocol. Uh, it's called the Southern Kurdufan uh, Comprehensive Peace Agreement for the resolution of the conflict in Southern Kurdufan and Blue Nile. It is a protocol that's supposed to go through a public consultation based on that there is democratic elections and then to negotiate with the center. And once they agree, then the protocol becomes a fine, final binding peace agreement of Southern Kurdufan and Blue Nile. At the moment, it is not yet a final binding comprehensive peace agreement for Southern Kurdufan and Blue Nile. They have to go through the public consultation. Now, they, 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 they recently the government, or again, the National Congress Party, asked the SPLM to withdraw these forces out of 1956 and disarm, and they cannot come over the 1956 borders with arms. And for the SAF to deploy, to redeploy up to the borders of 1956, in a way to cut strategic, de strategic depths between these forces and southern uh, Sudan. South Kurdufan, Blue Nile, they refused. And they, they are going to refuse disarmament because they know that the public consultation in the context now of the referendum, in a sort of a constitutional vacuum, it is not going to bring the final solution that it is acceptable to, to the people in southern Kurdufan and the Blue Nile. 
because as we know that it was supposed to be happening in, in the context of half a year of the interim period, there was democratic elections, and then uh, people who are elected in a fair, free elections, and then they, there is the public consultation, is still premised on the framework of the CPA. Now, in this transition after the South Sea seat, that's a sort of, of a vacuum of a framework. So you can imagine that if the public consultation is going to bring any lasting solution. That's why they want to keep their arms. They want to keep their forces because they know that there is a future challenge uh, meeting them. So, and I think this is, this is uh, a very big challenge. Recently, Salva Kiir agreed with uh, President Bashir to, to delay the, the redeployment of uh, SAF up to the borders of 19, uh, and I think it is an important. But the, the, the risk here is that NCP could uh, disagree or change their mind from here until then. What happens if they try to move their forces up to the borders of 1956 with not recognizing this specificity of Southern Kordofan and Blue Nile? That, I think, is one of the serious risks. There is the ceasefire agreement of Geneva 2002 which is incorporated in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement for Southern Kordofan, if you remember the, the Geneva ceasefire. There, for Southern Kordofan, it is still valid. It might be debatable if it is valid or not, but there is an agreement. But uh, the CPA did not actually stipulate anything for this kind of a situation, for the forces in Southern Kordofan and Blue Nile. So I think one of the challenges now is that the two parties, they need to renew the ceasefire agreement in southern Kordofan and looking in how to maintain a ceasefire in Blue Nile. I think this is one of the very big challenges in the coming period. And that, that's the role of the international community is very important. And to look into that, the public consultation cannot happen in a political, va in, 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 a, in, in a constitutional vacuum because the f constitution of Sudan is going to end in July 2011. After that, what is the constitution? And at the moment, if the public consultation is going to work on what? To, so that's why a lot of people argue that the constitutional arrangement have to be debated before the public consultation. And therefore, until this happens, a ceasefire needs to be maintained in Southern Kordofan and Blue Nile. And I think this is one of the high risks that people are not aware because people focus on ABA, ABA, and they don't see this point. As we know that they, 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 all the time, NCP wants it to weaken its partner because it's important. They see it as a strategic to, to negotiate with a weakened SPLM. And, uh, but now with the referendum going, I think this is uh, it's now subsiding because even the southerners who are opposing the SPLM, now at the moment they can't go against the current. Referendum is going a new country, so even the opposition parties uh, they, they in South Sudan, they need to be careful. So at the moment, there is no leverages to use and so on, and SPLM is becoming more stronger, but they might get weaker along that line, and as we are going to talk about it in the challenges of South Sudan. So in general, instability in South Sudan is not good for the NCP, but a political stable South Sudan cannot happen unless that there is a stable North Sudan, unless there is a stable, and vice versa. If the South hurts the North in one area, the North will be able to hurt it, and vice versa. So it is important that there is stability in both. And if people want stability in the South to progress, they have to seek stability in the North. And I think pluralism is the direction for both South Sudan and North and the North, given the diversity of cultures and regional interests. So it seems to me that the SPLM is aware of this. They had the South South all uh, South South all parties uh, consensus conference. They agreed on a framework. It is still on paper. It needs to be implemented after the referendum and the hangover of the referendum and the party is over. So that then they move to towards a pluralism. But uh, but the problem in the in the north even if that President Bashir recently said that he is calling for a government of national unity. It's a calling. But looking into the last 20 years and the six years, 
can we imagine that you had our 100% CPA took 28% or 48% of that, and now there is a possibility to go to 100%. Are you going to go for a national government to reduce your power to what? And that, that's a very big question, and it's going to create the reasons for continuous struggle in the north of Sudan. And, 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 uh, and this, of course, an approach like this will narrow the options for the opposition, will narrow the option for Darfur. Peace, dialogue, as we see, Abuja, Doha, Cairo agreement, Djibouti agreement, all the agreements. I mean, Sudan now is governed by how many agreements? Abuja, East Sudan, Cairo, Djibouti, all these agreements. Where are they? I mean, about seven or eight of them. They didn't go anywhere, including CPA, which became a ceasefire. So the options is, is very clear. The Darfurians, they picked it up earlier. Now Doha is not going anywhere. And I think they, 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 if people lose the opportunity to go to the boxes to change the situation, they will go for the boxes of the ammunition rather than the boxes of the elections to change the situation. So now at the moment, the South Sudan is secession is a reality. Is I think is a foregone. And, uh, and, and the government will not oppose it. And, uh, and the acceptance of the North to the referendum and the result, hopefully, that it will reflect positively in the relationship between the North, uh, the North and the South. And then the South will start to deal positively with the North and the North to, to try to deal reasonably and calmly with the pending issues. But of course, that will be jeopardized if one or within one of the two take a different approach. So if, 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 if people use the cessation of South Sudan as the first step or the first stage for a regime change, may, may some political forces think so, including people from outside, that is very dangerous for Sudan. I, I think people need to, to be thinking very seriously about this, and it shouldn't be a step for a regime change. And, uh, and it's a lot of people argue that in the recent America, the international community, managed to twist the arm of the NCP to accept the referendum and the results. And this perhaps encouraged the opposition parties, therefore rebel groups, to say that now it is the time since the, the bull started to, to fall, it is time to take out the knife and, and, uh, and kill the bull. And I think that is very dangerous for Sudan and stability, not just only for Sudan and for the region, because the Savannah Belt is highly mobilized, and the Islamist is highly mobilized, and it will not be easy for them uh, to let go. So I think what is really important here is that to forge a, a, a a strategic cooperation relationship between the North and South, to look into the constitutional arrangement that I talked about it, and how can the North and the South address this issue of pluralism, but also for the North. If there is no that discussion about the constitutional arrangement, the public consultation will not be resolved. The conflict in Darfur is not going to be resolved. As we know that Doha, I don't know where it is. I don't mean, know if somebody could tell me where is Doha now. And, uh, but there is an agreement. But that agreement, if there is a genuine solution to Darfur, then people have to address the cardinal issue in Sudan, governance, the issue of the center. And as I said, that will not be easily issue that the NCP will accommodate. That's why it is very difficult to go for a vice president, for a region, for a regional government with legislative and executive and so on, because also the Arabic tribes in Darfur are seriously co-opted, seriously co-opted, and they don't want a region. On the contrary, people want more localities, more districts, even more states in southern Darfur. Now we know that there is three. People are arguing for another three extra. Because the, uh, the, the, the thinking of, of, of the division and, and so on that actually led to the conflict in Darfur during the beginning of the Salvation Regime, 
when they were trying to put that Arabic Islamic civilization and the decentralization and the federalism dividing Darfur into the districts and the borders between the Hakura, the land ownership of the tribe were divided between others. With so many districts, everybody started to want to have the control of that district, which then led to the tribal differences. And that was the beginning of the conflict in Darfur. Uh, it started from the beginning of the 90s. Not the first beginning, of course, there is the historical reasons, but that was the key uh, point. So I, I, I agree with many people that Darfur needs to be resolved from the bottom up. Definitely, the Darfur-Darfur dialogue is extremely important. It was there in Abuja, and now the African Union panel on Darfur, they talked about the Darfur Forum, and now the government came out with a new strategy for Darfur, saying that let's find a solution in Doha, but at the end we bring it to Darfur Forum. In principle, in theory, it is good. But if we unpack it conceptually, it is very, very questionable. And I don't think it is a strategy that it will bring a lasting peace in Darfur. Because if it is supposed to bring lasting peace in Darfur, then the elections could have, should have been a fair elections where the representative in the Legislative Council of the three states are the true representative. Now, it is a strategy put by the government to be discussed by the legislative states of the three, the legislative council of the three states, which is actually the government, by the three governments, which is actually the government, by the tribal leaders who are co-opted by the government. So this is the government. So it is the government with the government with the government. I don't know where is the rebel groups and the rest of the Darfur people. And I think the African Union High Implementation Panel, where now they are advocating for let's go since Doha is not going, and I think maybe the Americans have got this also approach, that we go for that Darfur forum. I think that is a very grave mistake. It will deepen the crisis in Darfur. And uh, so, so just let me make it short and, uh, and then just to go over very quickly on, the, on, the, on, the, on South Sudan before I go further. For, for, for South Sudan, the issues, the challenges are immense. And uh, as we know that now, the, the, the party will continue in a couple of days until July, 9th July, where then they become independent. Then even the party will become more uh, stronger, hungover, may finish maybe at the end of the year. So there is one year of party jubilation and so on. But they need to look into the political stability. The, the SPLA is not a stable, it's not a professional army. So the issue of the security sector is a very big challenge for the SPLA, for the GOS. This is one. Political stability, inclusiveness, what they agreed with the South Sudanese uh, political parties, they need to foster that. They need really to implement it. First of all, the interim, national, the interim South Sudan constitution is going to end in July. They need to bring the political parties to have a discussion on another interim or a, a draft uh, constitution for South Sudan, because that will be the law of the land. And, and I think that is the first step. The DDR, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of soldiers and so on, that's something that is not going very well. There is a lot of arms, a lot of militias. The disarmament didn't go well in the past years. And if we look into the budget, that it comes actually from the oil revenue from the north, half of it or the majority of it is going salaries for this big, big, big security sector, army and so on, nothing going for social services and so on. So they need to reduce that army and so that then, then some of this money but how they are going to do the reintegration and demobilization, reintegration for these people to go to do what in South Sudan? Because even now the returnees who are coming from the north, they, we know that there is nothing for them at the moment. So imagine the, the challenges in front of the... And of course they have to, to address the issues of accountability very seriously. Corruption is very high. And, and I think during the jubilation period, 
they have to be very careful thinking of how they are going to use the money. If they agree with the government of the North or the NCP on the post-referendum issues and the oil and so on, those issues are very, very serious, and I'm not going to go into the details, as you all know. Nothing being agreed, but I think citizenship and so on is very important. So what I really see that the way forward here and that brings me to the regional and the international players, is that if we look into the region, Egypt, Libya, what is their interest on Sudan? They want a stability. I think so. Uh, the, the issue of the Nile waters that people talk a lot about it in, as far as Egypt is concerned, that is a bigger issue. The cessation is not going to affect it, in my opinion, because if South Sudan secedes, it will take its share from the north, from Sudan's. 15 or 18 billion cubic meters, not from the, so that's become, and, and so on. And still, the, the cooperation framework that recently signed by five or six countries is going to be an issue, and I don't see how South Sudan is going to affect this for the moment. And Egypt have been very good with South Sudan all the way. Actually, they work to make unity attractive more than the North. For Ethiopia, it's a serious concern because they have got borders with both countries, north and south. And I think they, they are really looking for the stability. But of course, Kenya, Uganda, they invested on the CPA through IGAT, and now I think they are reaping the benefit of their hard work on the CPA. And so they are business people, and they want stability. And of course, they don't mind the secession because that will accelerate their investment and reaping the the investment they did in the last six years and so on. Uh, but uh, of course, people are generally concerned about the Islamic discourse uh, that the NCP might take. In my opinion, NCP became a middle class business people who are really looking into their interests of work, wealth, money, more than, uh, than becoming, you know, the, the, the Islamic, uh, the, you know, the Iranian regime and so on. They are different in, in, in concert, in principle. Now, the recent call to go back to Sudan to a Sharia laws and beating of the guerre and all that what we heard is addressing the internal constituencies to keep them together because a lot of people within the Islamists started to ask several questions about their leadership. And it is not really solid, the Islamists together. And I think that call to go back is, is an important call to maintain the unity of the Islamists. You know that the vision happened in 2000 when Turabi left and that and the rest left, if this divided, and I think uh, that will be a problem, even for the rest of Sudan. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, but still, they have a very big challenge in the NCP to maintain that cohesion within them, because decisions now is in the hand of five, six. The shura that is supposed to work, the idea of the shura and the Islamic discourse, where it's a democratic process, that it goes to up, now it is very highly centralized. At the moment, there is no shura. And that will weaken the Islamic organization behind the National Congress Party. But still, they are the major players, and people need to deal with them. So I question the issue of the regime change. So and, and, and a lot of countries in the region, Ethiopia and so on, they think that the regime change is, shouldn't be the the, the way to go forward. It's how to maintain the stability because NCP have got the monopoly of weapons, of money, SPLM, of course the monopoly in the south, but for the north, NCP have got that monopoly. You need to deal with the NCP, they are the major players. And, and, and to see how we can get strategic cooperation and so on between the north and the south, and then to foster that, or to find political stability. Political stability in the north cannot happen unless there is an open space for political dialogue, for more pluralism, resolution of southern Kurdufan and Darfur so that they can feel that they are part of this rather than to contest the center and the resolution in Darfur. And I say this, this cannot happen if there is no serious rethinking of the political system in the center and the restructuring of the state. Maybe somebody is saying that, oh, this person is talking on behalf of the SPLM or the opposition party, and I don't know if any representative of the government of Sudan might say that this person just read a couple of newspapers of opposition, but it is a reality. If that doesn't happen, I think Sudan is going to face serious challenges. Final note that things that in Sudan, 
that uh, South Sudan, we can see that there is a lot of challenges. It might take time. I think so. But the problems in the north might not take time. Where we see now the referendum is finished, everything is going very well, results may be accepted, post-referendum discussion, ABA might be a problem, and so on. But the problems in the north are going to erupt faster than in the south. And that might jeopardize even the, the, the situation in South Sudan. That's, that's what I want to say. Uh, thank you, and uh, we have a discussion more. Thanks very much, uh, Fouad, for such a comprehensive uh, analysis of, of the, the picture, a very confused picture right now. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to, to questions in a moment, but perhaps first of all I could ask, ask you to think about, uh, let's look at the very short-term uh, picture and, and the actual referendum process itself and, and perhaps the role of the international community in, in that process. Um, we're told it's, it's going to take, obviously voting takes place over the whole of this week. Uh, the final outcome won't be known for several weeks after that. Um, we might have some results trickling out, I suppose, in the meantime, all of which uh, creates uh, conditions for uncertainty and, and perhaps instability and, and perhaps the worst case scenario of all that the outcome itself might be contested. Um, faced with this potential picture, what's the role for the international community, do you think, and uh, how, and particularly how should it be coordinating its response if the outcome is, is uh, somewhat uncertain or is challenged by, by perhaps the North or, or one of the other parties? So who should be taking the lead in this process? Um, when you think about that, I'll maybe take a couple of questions from, from the floor as well. Please identify yourself and uh, microphones should be on their way around as well. Uh, at the front here, please. Thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm Doug Brooks with the International Stability Operations Association. And to follow up on, uh, on that question, uh, specifically with the United Nations, uh, what, the, what should they be doing at this juncture right now that could be most beneficial uh, considering the situation? And let's take one more for, uh, for this round and then we'll uh, ask our respondents. Um, a gentleman in the, in the middle there, sir. Um, thank you. And, uh, uh, my question to Fuad is about the recent development uh, um, from the NCB side. We all know that the NCB was reluctant to uh, do any arrangements related to post referendum and um, even uh, accepting the referendum results. Recently, the NCB started to publicly say, and in particular, President Bashir, that he will accept the results and the new state of South Sudan will be recognized. Why do we think this? Southern shift. Uh, the second question, can you elaborate more about the African Union High Implementation uh, Panel in relation to doing the negotiation between North and South? Thank you. Okay, who wants to uh, tackle some or uh, all of those questions? Yeah. Don't ask me challenging questions. <laughs> Uh, I want just to say hello to my friend there, and it's good to hear you. Uh, I think the role of the international community is extremely important for, for the results. Uh, the, 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 there is a lot of observers, European Union, League of Arab States, African Union, the Carter Center, a lot of observers. Plus, of course, the UN uh, have got uh, an, a special panel separate because, as we know, that UNMIS is working on the logistics and the, the technical support, and, and so it cannot be the, the body that, uh, that certify or uh, to make a statement on the process, because it is part of it. That's why there is the panel uh, led by uh, President uh, Nkaba, of former president of Tanzania. And uh, what is really important now for the, the international community and especially the role of the UN panel, plus of course the other observers and monitors, is to keep on on day-to-day -day basis to communicate very clearly to the Sudanese, to the international community on the process, how is it going? I think this is very important, not to leave it 
until the end, where then the results is going to be contested. And in terms of the contestation, I don't think so, because if the NCP wanted to contest it, uh, they could have actually derailed the whole process, because there were sufficient grounds that legally some of the petitions were taken to the, to the Constitutional Court. It could have derailed the, the or could have, uh, but I think thanks to the NCP and President Bashir didn't want to pursue and stop that. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and he said that actually in his speech in Juba because they, he wants the referendum to go and they are going to accept the results. Uh, of course, the petitions are there. Still, it can appear in the coming days. It's still, it might surprise us, surprise us, but I doubt and I hope not. But the international community, I think, is very important, especially the panel, is to communicate on a day-to-day basis. How is it going? If there is anything, to mention it, so that then the results is, uh, is, uh, is not uh, contested. And I think the panel is, uh, is very important. How the NCP accepted this? I think the NCP, what is before the conclusion of the CPA, wanted more time. So that's why they wanted the referendum to be postponed in the beginning to address their vulnerability. And when you talk about the vulnerability, because the NCP is the state, and the state is the NCP in the north. And when you talk about the vulnerability of the state, is the vulnerability of the party, the vulnerability of the party is the vulnerability of the state, unfortunately, because in Sudan it is like that. And so the vulnerability, one is the divisions within the, 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 the Islamists themselves. That could have been very serious. After the elections, things went very bad and then goes back again and it went bad and so on. So how, how to mitigate that vulnerability within the party itself, the organization itself? And the second thing is to address the issues of economy, the economic situation, to build up reserves and also to negotiate on the referendum and the post-referendum to negotiate other things. As we know, the, 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 the issues of uh, Sudan uh, relation with the US and all the issues in between, the list of uh, being listed the terrorists and, and uh, the other sanctions and so on. And also the issue of the ICC. So it delayed by time to address internal issues and also external issues. But uh, it didn't go anywhere. There is some cards being provided by the, and that cards was very, very supportive. And I don't think it sticks works on the NCP. I personally, I don't think so. Any thinking of uh, another Afghan, Iraq, or Sudan bombing and so on doesn't work. That will burn the whole region. So I don't think, but that was one of the reasons that they start to think that, okay, these issues, it's very difficult to delay, to delay, to delay, because the region is going to go against, even they were going to lose the, like the League of Arab States and the African Union. And inside, if they continue, they might not be stable as an organization. And I think that's the decision. More they, they, they decided that let go of the, the referendum to happen, more than the, the external pressures. External pressures play a role, but I think more internal reasons that made them to decide Okay, let it go, let it happen, and then we deal with the consequences. Thank you. Uh, Comfort, is there anything yeah. you'd like to add? In that case, let's uh, have another round of questions then. Um, let's take David up the front here. Uh, uh, microphone's on its way, sorry. Just, oh. David through CSIS. Um, I must confess that I think there is pretty gross ignorance in this town about Sudanese politics and little understanding of the problems of Khartoum. Um, I was interested in what you said and I'd, I'd like to push you a little further about what is probably the fundamental problem from, from the perspective of President Bashir. Um, and that is actually the factional divisions within the NCP. Um, there is a tendency to, to see the NCP as a uniform bloc. Uh, and I think that's fundamentally wrong, that there are serious fault lines. Um, and that Islamism as an ideology was, was fairly attractive 
to many northern Sudanese, and not only in the Nile Valley, but in the periphery as well in the 1990s. And that the Islamist agenda still has many supporters who may well be mobilized um, by what they see as perhaps a, a compromise, a sellout, over the independence of southern Sudan and the negation of 200 years of Sudanese history. Um, so my question is, what do you see as, as the strains and the pressures from the, the Islamists within the NCP, and indeed without the, the NCP, those who followed Turabi into opposition in 2000? How potent a challenge are they? Obviously, Darfur, Southern Côte d'Afin, um, the Blue Nile are fundamental issues. Um, but if I were sat in Khartoum, I'd be much more worried about these guys uh, and, and what they are likely to do. And I, I think the international community does not pay sufficient attention uh, to this problem that the regime faces. Um, so, so I'd be interested to, to know what you think about that. Thank you. Um, let's take a question right at the back there, the gentleman in the corner. I'm Jeremy Kneindijk from Mercy Corps. Um, a question about the post-referendum reconstruction of the South. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of um, uh, the World Bank, of the UN, of the NGO community in terms of some of the development activities that have occurred in the South and the, the limited um, success in going beyond just humanitarian service provision and getting to actual development and reconstruction. Um, and some recent criticism levied, particularly at the World Bank-run uh, multi-donor trust fund. Um, with the government of South Sudan, as, as Mr. Hikma, you pointed out, still spending upwards of 90 percent of its revenues on, um, on, on security sector issues, not able to invest very much in, uh, in social service provision. What do you see as the prospects for actually uh, getting beyond a paradigm of sort of NGO-provided services and getting to a point where the government of South Sudan has both adequate revenue and adequate capacity and uh, will to start providing those services and funding those services. And what do you see as a, a donor structure or an international funding structure that would be more effective than what we've seen so far in getting us, or getting both the aid community and the government of South Sudan to that point? Okay, and let's, uh, let's take one more question. The gentleman at the, at the front here. Is microphone's on its way. Uh, yes, Marcus Guino, uh, U.S. Department of State. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on, on part of the question uh, of the second gentleman. Um, I, I was a little bit surprised, uh, Mr. Hickmott, by how pessimistic you were about the framework uh, that the AU had uh, brokered uh, in Addis. Uh, when Pagan Amun was here back in November and, and spoke to a group at USIP, he, he was far more upbeat in terms of saying that he felt that although the no framework agreement had been signed, uh, that there had been large agreement on major issues, uh, including areas such as wealth sharing. He, he cited citizenship and ABA as being the two outstanding areas, uh, but he, he was upbeat, uh, for example, on demarcation. He used the 80% figure uh, in terms of agreement. Um, the, the question really is, how you view the AU in all of this, uh, particularly on uh, North-South, and, and specifically your, your, your thoughts on, on the role of Tabo Mbeki, who certainly has emerged uh, both for the South uh, and for Darfur in a major role, um, and how you think that AU role uh, will continue after the referendum. Thank you. Okay, and, and let's uh, also here, we have uh, our representative from the government of, uh, of Sudan, uh, Fatou Rahman Ali Mohammed, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission. Would you like to uh, say something as well? Uh, thank you, uh, Downey, and thank you, Mr. Hikmet, for this uh, deep analysis on uh, our country, are also Sudanese, and sometimes your views might be having some, uh, uh, your, your own analysis on some views uh, might uh, give uh, okay I would like first to, to say in this uh, critical time of uh, Sudan and the history there is a uh, bold uh, points which uh, I think it, it might be raised on this 
the, the positive uh, side of this historical moment is that there is, there is a referendum which is uh, recognized and the outcome, outcome is uh, expected to be <coughs> recognized by the whole parties. The president uh, said this and the vice president commented this. And at this moment also people should uh, be optimistic about uh, which before they, 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 they were very worried about uh, this critical moment, how it, how it goes. It's a positive direction of uh, recognition of this time. The peace dividend at this time should be also recognized. There's uh, also some worries uh, and uh, rumors and disinformation, disinformation about uh, this critical moment uh, also here and there. But the, the, the challenge which is uh, uh, he raised about this, this critical time, the challenge of, uh, uh, of the, the outcome which is coming in, the, the, in this uh, in the coming weeks, and uh, the worries about uh, if the, this, this uh, new state might be uh, in confrontation with the North, I think the, the, the visit of the president said it clear that the outcome would be recognized. And the challenge of after post-referendum issue <laughs> regarding the, the citizenship, the security arrangements between the two, the, the area, ABA, and many other critical issues which you, you mentioned here, the two sides now they are negotiating that. Mbiki is uh, uh, working with his uh, high implementation uh, group. And the two sides now also they are working on, on, on discussing these issues. President, Vice President Taha from uh, the center and uh, Dr. Riyak Mashar, Riyak Mashar from the, the southern side, they are negotiating and they are, uh, they are tabling these issues one by one. And as uh, uh, one of the colleagues here mentioned that even uh, Bagan Amun was uh, optimistic about uh, many issues that were uh, st step forward in that issues. But I think what you, you raise here is uh, a bit optimistic that now people are optimistic that some challenge will be overcome in the coming time. If this referendum recognized, if the international community also satisfied about this process between the North and the South, then another sa satisfaction will be if the people of the citizenship also agreed upon and uh, declared the constitutional uh, vacuum which you, you mentioned that there is now legislative uh, organs in the South and the North. The election of last uh, April come with the uh, parliament, the regional parliament, and these issues also will be discussed. Of course, the, the other political uh, political parties will be included, as the president said, that uh, broad-based government will be under discussion with the political uh, parties. But also there is a regional and central uh, parliament that will uh, be in, in power. But the, these post-referendum issues is uh, now under the negotiation. Locally between the, the bit, uh, in, in, inside the country between the north and the south, these committees are working in, in Addis Ababa and again in Juba, and now there is a committee for together to come with uh, with uh, There are many other challenges that you, you mentioned here, but even the, the ABA issue, people now they are working to, on, uh, the, the, there is a delay also in the, when there is disagreement on the who will, will vote. So there is a delay of, uh, on the, the uh, referendum in, in ABA, this is a challenge also. But I think the referendum now uh, and the people starting to, to vote within a week uh, will give, uh, people are, optimist about, uh, are optimistic about the, the result and uh, how the people would, uh, would respond to, to this will make uh, the peace process going for a step forward and not to go backward. Uh, what I, I want to, to conclude that uh, I think that the, the views which is uh, you, you, you shared 
or you, you, you put, I think uh, it is a bit uh, uh, gloomy. I, I hope that the people would, uh, uh, would be optimistic about the result since the uh, president said it and the, vice the first vice president uh, Selva Kerr also said it, I think there might be uh, some uh, good fruits for the, the, the peace dividend in the, the whole process, even in the, the north and in the south. And we hope that uh, many of your worries will come uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the other side, in the positive direction, and the country will, will prevail peace in the, the coming time and we will hear uh, the co more cooperation between the north and the south in the coming time. Thank you. Thanks for those uh, those those remarks. And uh, any any responses to the questions? We had uh, uh, more details on uh, sort of NCP internal dynamics and strength of the Islamists within them. Uh, question of long-term development in the south, uh, whether the south will become sort of economically uh, self-sufficient, um, and then a question from the uh, State Department representative about the, are you being a little bit too gloomy about the uh, the efforts of the high-level implementation panel on the uh, post-referendum negotiations? So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me start with the with the question from the State Department and. Um, and which is a little bit also touching on uh, on uh, my brother here from uh, the embassy. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit worried of what you said because that's actually the rhetoric that took us to problems in Sudan, but I will come to it. Uh, but in terms of, 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 the, of the AUHIP, I'm not uh, pessimistic. The framework is very important, but what I said, this is what have been reached so far. And if you remember, the decision was taken in September last year in Abuja when presented the report and then the security, the Peace and Security Council mandated the panel to become a high implementation panel and they gave them extra, not just on Darfur, but to work on the CPA. Much have been achieved. And I think the framework itself, including the principles, is very important. And what is actually important now is that those principles to be communicated to the people because a lot of people doesn't know actually what is in this framework and what are those principles. For example, the communities at the ground where now there is an active mobilization of the PDF of the tribes along the borders of 1956 is that they, if that is communicated that there is no need because issues are going to be resolved, as, uh, as my colleague here said, there's no need for the military buildup, no need for mobilization of the PDF. On the contrary, those efforts to go for, for something positive, something else. So those principles need to come. But still, the post-referendum issues need to be discussed in the coming six months. And I think the, the, the role of Mbeki and the African Union panel supported by the, by the IGAT and the international community partners and so on is key and is extremely important. And I think without it, uh, 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 the, the other, but, but the point is that unfortunately, the, the, the panel is not mandated. They cannot come and bring the two parties to say, come here, I need to discuss with you. It's there to facilitate the two parties to discuss and when they want, then they can ask and make it to come and facilitate uh, that process to give the support. Uh, I don't mean here imply that he need to be mandated, but I think in the coming period, the, the, the African Union panel need really, and President Mbeki, to push these two parties to sit and to discuss the post-referendum. And I know that there is this community, uh, com committees and so on, discussing on the post-referendum. But contrary to what you said before yesterday, Luca Bionk, who is the presidential, uh, in the, in the cabinet of the government of national unity says, no discussion on post-referendum issues unless we resolve ABA. And this is somebody sitting next to the president. So anyhow, uh, they, they, but still, it is, a, it is a very, very important. And uh, so I don't uh, pessimistic, but if there is no that thinking of a strategic relationship, uh, which I, I alluded to in my, uh, in my presentation, if the two parties doesn't agree on what kind of form, in principle, what is the form of relationship? Is it a uh, union, uh, political separation, but we are going to union in, in terms of economics? 
that the currency will be the same, no need for another currency, we will agree on the oil, that will soften the, the border. The issue of citizenship, we agree. Everybody remains if you want to be here or there, no need to kick the 24,000, no need to push the, the southerners and so on. So that atmosphere is negative atmosphere. It's not a positive atmosphere. It is started by one of the senior NCP people saying not a single injection for southerners. That's the spokesperson of the government of national unity, but, but I think I don't think it's the spokesperson. The, it's an NCP government. So that's a person saying this. And then President Bashir reversed those uh, sentences, said, no, 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 we will protect, we will this, we will that. And then comes Sharia laws is going to be implemented, immediately followed by 20% have to go out from the civil service, we'll consider them as foreigners. What kind of a policy is this? I don't know how to describe it, that if this is a policy for, for mutual and peaceful, you are setting a tone for a very difficult confrontation on the post-referendum discussions. Uh, I agree that uh, the, 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 there is a fundamental problems, and it's very difficult to shift uh, at the moment from the humanitarian assistance uh, into, I have been in this field for a couple of years in the humanitarian before coming to crisis group and, uh, and uh, it, that definitely people need to shift the humanitarian assistance into long term to, to, to adjust the pipeline of the, of, the, of the humanitarian assistance and to get adapters for long term so that it doesn't go out. And that's always the debate of that continuum. And, uh, but the first for the South is get their independence, become a member of the United Nations, be assessed by the IMF, and then recommend World Bank to give money for development, which is going to create unemployment. At the moment, this process is yet. There is no money for major development that could create jobs in, 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 uh, in, uh, in South Sudan. So the priority is to work on the security sector, to reform that security sector, to continue building the institutions while fostering the political consensus to ensure that there is political instability to accommodate those who are against the SPLM so that when the Han over is finished, at least then they can have a, a common ground where they can all move together. First, they need to address the issue of identity. A lot of people think Southerners are homogeneous and there is South Sudan identity. There is no South Sudan identity. I am a Dinka, I am anywhere. When it comes to, to elections, everybody goes to their constituency. That's why the issue of ABA, some of the Southerners say that, why do we need to jeopardize our relation just because of ABA? I mean, it's so a small thing. But the people, the leaders at the top in the SPLM who are from ABA, Luca Bianca and all this, said, no, 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 this is very important. Because imagine in two years there is elections in South Sudan. People still go to your constituent. Who are you? Where are you from? If you say, I am from ABA, which is part of the North, who is going to vote for you to be a member of the government? Sorry, your constituency is on the other side. So that's why they, they, they want by any means that ABA to remain part of the... So th there is no that issue of identity. They need to work. And the beginning of it is to set up the rule of the law, the, the, the rule of the land where they need to agree and to put the political system for inclusiveness. And then definitely, if that stage is there, we'll be able to create the conditions from shifting from humanitarian assistance into a long-term rehabilitation, reconstruction, which is, it's going to be ideologically, of course, driven. And, and on what ideology? Is it the SPLM or is it an inclusive government to put that uh, framework for, for reconstruction and development. Definitely, it is a challenge. Uh, finally, I come to the question, I think, which is uh, a very serious question, uh, the, the, the issue of the Islamists. And, and, uh, and I, I agree with you, it's not a uniform block, and there is a, not a lot of deep understanding to the issues of Sudan. People tend to think of NCP, South Sudan, but if you want really to understand the problems of Sudan, you have to go deeper into the Islamic movement. Then you will understand why the CPA had happened during the discussions of Mashakos, 
or maybe go a little bit later, when is the fairest possibility of real unity of Sudan was lost? It was lost during the Kokodam Agreement, when the Islamists and the DUP didn't go on the Kokodam Agreement. That was the fairest opportunity for real united Sudan after the regime of Nimeri fell. Islamists didn't want to go, DUP didn't. Then there was the transitional of uh, Suwara Dahab, and then there was an election. The all forces in Sudan agreed to postpone the elections, to have a constitutional conference, to discuss about the constitution of Sudan, the nature of the Sudanese state, and to abolish the September laws, which is the Sharia laws, by the Islamists when they joined uh, uh, Bashir. Islamists refused, and when uh, Sadiq al-Mahdi went for the elections and won and became the prime minister, he formed maybe about five governments, three of them or two of them with the Islamists, brought back the Islamists, and that is where PDF and all these, the war intensified and SPLM was about to take Juba. When the international really support for the SPLM, they were about to take this one, uh, that that's became a problem, and that's when they wrote, they, the military wrote the message to prime minister saying, either you do something or we are going to change the regime. So Mergani made the agreement with Garang, and they agreed on the, on the agreement to go and implement the Kokodam outcomes with the Mergani, uh, Mergani John Garang agreement. They agreed, and that abolishing, not abolishing, but to suspend, freeze, the, the, the Sharia laws, accept Sudan as an Arabic, African, but not an Islamic. And to go for the constitutional review conference, to review and put the constitution, form an interim government with SPLM, SAF, political parties, and all the, the, the civil society, the trade unions, and so on, and, and including the Transitional Military Council of Suwara Dahab and the Juzuli at that time. They all agreed. So after pressure, Sadiq al-Mahdi removed Turabi from power, from, from the government. He formed again a government with the DUP of al mergani And they agreed finally on the constitutional conference. That would have led to the, but who then very quickly made a coup? Islamist. They made the coup because they, they, they simply doesn't want that to happen. They removed the democratic period, closed the door for constitutional conference, and we know what happened. So that's why halfway the idea is to create that Islamic country where the Islamic organization of the Islamic movement that, uh, you know, it, it uh, how do I say it, uh, that it simulates the Sudanese people into that Islamic thinking through the organization, of course, creating a patronage system related with all the tribes and the groups and so on, and then with barons who serve that patronage system, which is the rulers of the state, who also make their own patronage system within the state. And to simulate the whole Sudanese together into that Islamic discourse, and then to go for federalism and decentralized. But they took it wrong. The military was supposed to move after three months, three years. The disguised military, the Islamist in the military form, Al Bashir and all this. They were supposed to move after three years. That's what they agreed to make the coup, put the Turabi in prison, after so that nobody knows that it is an Islamist. Then take out the Turabi, but they were hiding. They were doing that. They were driving the whole thing, and then the military to go out of three months, three years and to start to put the constitution of Sudan, federalism, decentralization, the military refused. They like it because they have been three years there. So they refused for, for a Turabi. So, okay, President Bashir became the president. Uh, he's a vice president uh, who died uh, late, uh, I forgot his name, uh, uh, the, the vice president. And, and, and then they, the military became the power. President Bashir remained. And that continued until, until today. And so they, they, they had that discussions and division until when they disagreed on the federalism and the decentralization system, and also that the army should go back to the barracks and the civilians to rule and to go back to the shura. When they disagreed, they divided. 
And so what remained now in the NCP became the business people who felt the money, and that the oil was a problem. It's always an oil problem when oil is discovered. And, uh, and, 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 and so that became a problem. And, uh, and, and so when the money started to flow, that patronage system became so strong. And now, bit by bit, that patronage system, it went into ethnic patronage system. If you go to the palace, you will see whose, whose tribe is this, to the NISS, to, 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 to the government's post, to the positions, to everything. They cleansed the civil services, the army, they fired the generals, the police, the civil service, and everything. That's, that's a system now, a very serious of a patronage system. But now, with the cessation coming, of course, people are asking questions. For President Bashir himself, you ruled for 20 years. You did a couple of agreements. The CPA came. You didn't maintain the unity of Sudan, and you want to continue ruling Sudan. On what basis? On what legitimacy you want to continue ruling Sudan? So the NCP have got a question to question the president versus the future of the party as a political party, the party versus the future of Sudan and the stability of Sudan. Now it is split, but also the stability in the north, finding solution to Darfur, Southern Kurdufan, and also the president versus the whole future of Sudan. Between brackets, there is the issues of IC. Those three fundamental questions need to be asked within the Islamist if they want to maintain, to continue as a viable political party to play. That's why there is those divisions within even the current. And I can go further, but I can see eyes looking at me. And, uh, but it's a major, major question. And uh, so that's why I question uh, the ambassador here talking about, yes, the president said and so on. I understand that I'm Sudanese. It's not about saying. It is about what are the key issues you want to do in the coming period. Post-referendum issues, it have to address the vulnerability of the party, which became a state. That state have to be separated from the party. Art is the NCP willing to do that? If not, that will continue the struggle to find a viable, lasting peace in Sudan. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very reluctant to stop you in, uh, in mid-flow for I very much uh, appreciate uh, your analysis. But I'm afraid we're pretty much out, out of time now. Uh, I don't know if Comfort, do you have anything to add? Or, uh, OK, fair enough, fair enough. Well, look, I'd just like to, to thank you, for, uh, both of you, for coming and agreeing to take part on, on what is really a momentous time right now with the referendum underway. And I'm, I'm sure you all agree, despite the sort of notes of uh, well, some gloominess and pessimism that Sudan has come a long way to this point at least. Uh, but of course, you, uh, the challenges, uh, big challenges that lie ahead, uh, both internally within North and, and South, and, and how these uh, two uh, areas, if they are to separate, govern themselves and manage the diverse peoples and interests within their borders. So uh, please join me in, in thanking our two guests, Fuad uh, Hikmat and Comfort Aero. And thanks for your interest, and uh, we'll be following the uh, twists and turns of the referendum and beyond at CSIS, and you can find more information on our website. And uh, similarly, ICG will be putting out uh, a new report on Sudan shortly. Will there, be on there is a report that uh, somebody is working on it, actually on the big question, the Islamists and the future of Sudan after cessation. And that's the key question, I think, for me. Great. Well, thanks very much.